to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today is a special show in collaboration with Williams Sonoma, and my special guest is Marlo Thomas. Marlo Thomas is an award-winning actress, author, and activist whose body of work continues to impact American entertainment and culture. She has been honored with four Emmy Awards, the Peabody, a Golden Globe, and a Grammy, and has been inducted into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame. In 2014, President Barack Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now, we all know Marlo when she burst onto the scene in television's That Girl, breaking new ground for independent women everywhere, including this independent woman. This is a show that she conceived and produced. You'll hear her tell the story today. Her pioneering spirit continued with her creation of Free to Be You and Me, which became a platinum album, best-selling book, Emmy award-winning television special, and a stage show. Proceeds from this project went towards the formation of the Ms. Foundation for Women, which Marlo will tell us about that as well today too. Marlo has produced eight best-selling books, three of them New York Times number one bestsellers, including Free to Be You and Me, Free to Be a Family, The Right Words at the Right Time, Volumes 1 and 2, Thanks and Giving All Year Long, which became a Grammy-winning CD, her memoir, Growing Up Laughing, It Ain't Over Till It's Over, and in 2020, What Makes a Marriage Last, which she co-authored with her husband, talk show pioneer, Phil Donahue. For her activism, Marlo has been honored with the Helen Caldecott Award for Nuclear Disarmament, the ACLU's Thomas Paine Award, the American Women in Radio and Television Satellite Award, the William Kunstler Racial Justice Award, the National Civil Rights Museum Freedom Award, and the Jefferson Award for Public Service, which she received along with Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Marlo is the National Outreach Director for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which was founded by her dad, Danny Thomas, in 1962. After his death, she became the face and the voice of St. Jude. And in 2004, she created the hospital's annual Thanks and Giving Campaign, a national holiday fundraising and awareness program that has raised more than $1 billion to date. In 2014, in recognition of her commitment to the hospital, St. Jude christened its newest building, the Marlo Thomas Center for Global Education and Collaboration. Now, Marlo is beginning 2020-21 with a bang. In February, she launched her own line of unique tabletop settings in partnership with the home furnishings giant, William Sonoma. Tapping into Marlo's renown as the consummate hostess, William Sonoma invited her to recreate dozens of the unique pieces that she has discovered over decades of world travel, from the porcelain markets in Kyoto, Japan, to the iconic Portobello Road in London. And in March, Marlo and Phil will debut their original podcast series about marriage, Double Date, featuring intimate conversations with long married celebrity couples from Jimmy and Rosalind Carter to Viola Davis and Julius Tennant to Elton John and David Furnish. The series is based on the couple's best selling book, What Makes a La- Marriage Last, and it's produced by Pushkin Industries. It is my great privilege and honor to bring this conversation to you. I hope you enjoy it even just one-tenth that I have. Hi, Marlo. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hey, Luann. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to talk to you. You know, that's funny. You're excited. (laughs) (laughs) I'm excited. 
Oh, my goodness. I have had the privilege over these last five and a half years of interviewing amazing, amazing people. But this is, I have to say, I think the first time interviewing somebody who is so iconic from my own life and, you know, just life, childhood, uh, womanhood, everything. And so I'm really grateful. Yeah, really grateful for this chance. Um, You know what I want to share with you, Marlo, is... Of course, you know, I grew up with that girl. And I, of course, I just thought you were just the coolest person. (laughs) I wish you were my big sister every single day, right? (laughs) And um, the thing is, though, you know, getting ready for the interview, then I do my research. It's like, okay, this is a full, you know, rounded human being. And I knew what I knew. Of course, I knew about your dad and about St. Jude's. And of course, I knew about your husband, Phil, because he's also an iconic person from my childhood. I remember high school being run home oh, to want to watch the, you know yeah. Phil Donahue show right in, in college and everything yes and um but the thing Marlo what I learned when I was in interv- was when I was researching for the interview is that I thought that girl was just a cool fun show and what I learned is and I want to ask you it feels like it couldn't have just been a coincidence that this show was about expressing you know, a woman's individ- individuality and a woman's right to be be anything she wants to be. Because I learned that that has been repeated in so many areas of your life that I was not aware of. So is it chicken or the egg? Is it like that instilled it into you, that experience? Or you're like, no, Luann, that is who I was. Yeah, I, I had an opportunity uh, to define the show I wanted to do because I had done another pilot for ABC that didn't sell. And luckily, ABC and Clairol, the sponsor, thought I could be a television star. I had never met them, of course. They were big wigs, and I was just this little kid who got a good job. And uh, they said, you can be a TV star. We'd like to find something for you to do. And they sent me a lot of scripts, and I called up Mr. Sherrick, and I said, you know, everything you've sent me, is the girl is the wife of somebody, she's the daughter of somebody, she's the secretary of somebody. Did you ever think of doing a show where the girl is the somebody, a girl like me? You know, I said, I graduated college <laughs> and uh, I don't want to get married. My my dad is nagging me to get married and have children. And, uh, and I want to go to New York and be an actress. I said, that was my, that's who I was. And I really, he, and he said, well, would anybody watch a show like that? And I said, you know, there's a book out called The Feminine Mystique. You should read it because that's really where it's going. That women today, young girls today, are not dreaming about being their moms. They want to be somebody else. They, 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 they. they it's in the air. It's in the water. And if you read The Feminine Mystique, you'll see that. But what was really interesting is that ever since I was a little girl, my dad used to call me Miss Independence uh, because I. Was, had a very, very strong opinion of what I wanted, what I wanted to do. And I, I wasn't a cookie cutter kind of kid. And so I think I was born that way. I was born uh, as an activist, you know, as a feminist, as a, as a, as a girl who had a mind of her own. And, um, and, there, and I think what mm-hmm. that girl proved as a television show is that every household in America had a that girl in it. You know, we were this gigantic success the very mm-hmm. first night. And that wouldn't have happened if there weren't these little girls and young women all over the place who thought, oh, wow, that could be me or that is me or that's who I want to be. Because that's what the mm-hmm. male all said. They wanted to dress like me. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to be Anne Marie. They wanted <laughs> to have their own apartment. They wanted to get a job in the big city. Um, They wanted to have a boyfriend. They didn't necessarily want to get married. I mean, this was all happening. You know, this is the 60s and 70s. That was the beginning of the women's movement. I didn't know anything about the women's movement. I was just a very singular female who knew what she wanted. And then when the women's movement came along, I realized, oh, I'm not the only one. Um, And that was exciting. I realized that that there was Mm. a whole tribe. But uh, I don't doubt that you love that girl as a young girl because it would have spoken you know right to you because look who you are you have your own show you have your own life you you mm-hmm. have uh, your own voice i've only spoken to you for a few minutes just before this show started and it's 
obvious. You you have a mission. You know who you are and you know what you want to do. That isn't true of uh, the generation before us. That wasn't true. Well, and that's so, you know, even listening to you, it is. I I, I knew by watching that, I, I, I literally right. was just like, this is what I want to do. I mean, I'm now going to be 59 years old, and I literally still say to my husband every year, when, you know, like, I think it's time to buy the apartment in New York City. And he's like, we're not doing that. <laughs> like, like, it's in me from when I was a kid. It was like, I have to live in That's New York so City. Funny. That girl lived in New York City. You know what I mean? And then, of course, right. Mary Tyler Moore comes later and she's in Minneapolis. But it's still that city. Right. Right. You know, we want to do it. We can do it. Right. And I'll tell you, God forbid, with the COVID That's now, right. like, this really is the is. time to invest it's in definitely New a buyer's market. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Anyway, but it's just, um, I just, it, it, I, it's funny because when you say it was in you, I think it's different. I'm, I'm only a half generation younger than you. So when you say it's in you, I already know what, what it was like for me growing up. And then when I put that half generation again to what it was like for you, the courage and the self-awareness and the self-confidence for you to really, I mean, what would you have been in your early yeah. 20s saying to a big producer at a, a major network I know, going, I know. dude, I, did you read The Feminine you know, Mystique? I yeah, mean, you're schooling uh, them, it's, right? It's interesting that you asked that question because so many people have asked that of me. How, how did you get to be that confident in 24 years old? I don't know. I, I really do not know. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, mm. I, I, uh, I, I read from Mike Nichols and got the London Company of Barefoot in the Park. And I was on the plane going to London where I didn't know anybody. Um, and as I was on the plane, I, I got kind of scared over the water. I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing? Are you moving to London for a year? You don't know anybody. <laughs> You don't even know if you'll be fired from this job. I mean, this is crazy. And it was almost like if I could have, I would have turned the plane around. But I had, it isn't that I never had a self doubt or a fear or something. I just kept going, you know. Uh, uh, and with, with the Edgar Sherrick and the Feminine Mystique, I knew those shows were old fashioned. You know, I thought, why would anybody want to be mm. Donna Reed or the the mother in the Partridge family. I mean, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to play those parts. I knew, <laughs> I was, you know, so I thought, and, and I had had a lot of experience when young people say to me or ask me, you know, how do you start in show business? How do you start as an actor? And I always say, start in little theater, community theater in every single city. Mm. And that's what I did. I, I, I lived in LA, but I went to Laguna mm. Beach. I went up to Ojai. I w there were all kinds of Santa Barbara. There were all these places that had these little theaters. And I auditioned and I got parts for them. And I did big parts. I played Gigi at Laguna Beach. You know, I played big uh, parts under the Yum Yum Tree, Two for the Seesaw. I was getting my my sea legs, you know. By, by the time I opened in London, I, yes. I was uh, like I was around 24 years old. That's when I had called. Uh, Edgar Sherrick, because we did the pilot right after London, and I uh, I was ready, I, I was absolutely ready. And my advice always is, yeah. everybody I think gets a chance, but not everybody gets a second chance. So be ready for that first chance. And man, I was mm -hmm. ready. I was seasoned as a young girl. I had already mm -hmm. done a lot of theater, and so by the time I came back from London to do that girl, I was a veteran. I was like 26 years old by now, but I was a veteran. I really knew what I was doing. And um, and that's why if you ever look at the mm. very first show we did, that is not a novice. You know, that that's somebody, you know, that is a seasoned young actress. Right. And I and I had earned it. And I, you know, said, and that's true in every single, yeah. no yeah. matter what job you're in. You know, you, you what, what did they say? You have to have 10,000 hours before you're really ready. You know, I had I had put in my ten thousand mm -hmm. hours. Mm. Yeah, we say on the show yeah. all of the time, you yeah. have to be prepared to get lucky, 
right? So you have to be prepared for when that opportunity comes. And, you know, for the interior design industry, we have young designers coming out of school or just going out on their own, following a different path to design. And, um, you know, there's always a lot of conversation about, oh, you know, I don't really know how to source and it takes me five hours to find something and somebody else finds it in an hour. And we say, you got to do that work on your own. That's like doing your small theater. (laughs) You don't, you're showing up for the client. That's the big show. Right. But what do you do? What did you do before that? And I always use the analogy for for the baseball players. They show up at the plate, but they had, you know, 20,000 times at batting practice for the last six months before the the season opened. Right. Oh, yeah. And also the minor leagues and the triple A and all of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. The triple the triple A are the community theaters. I mean, that's where you learn it. That's where that's where that's where you get to fail. Right, right. And the, and right. that's the thing, mm-hmm. because the learning comes in the failures, right? Right. Yeah. And, and you learn from it. You, you get more more. That's what they mean by when you're seasoned, you know, you do it and then you figure out another way. And mm-hmm. uh, th- that's the thing about uh, being the child of someone famous. I was always afraid that I couldn't hide somewhere and fail. Uh, but I was able to do that in little mm-hmm. theater around, you know, uh, California. Uh, that I in the Southwest that I could go mm-hmm. to those places where nobody really cared, you know. And did you get the bug from acting because you grew up with your father, and of course your godmother was also an actress? Is it just you know? Do you think you would have been you would have had the bug for it if you were born to school teachers? Well, of course, there's no way to answer that question. Yeah, I know, right? I guess. Yeah. But I mean, I think. I think what I got from yeah. my father was the love of hard work and the love, the love of knowing mm. what it takes to do what he did. You know, he, he was a stand up comedian and then he was a television star. And I watched how hard he worked rewriting scripts, rewriting his act, listening to his act on a tape recorder. He'd come back from Las Vegas and he'd listen to the act and he would show me what, what he was going to take out. I could hear it on the tape recorder what he was going to take out, where, where a song needed to go. I mean, it wasn't just a guy who gets up and tells some jokes. He was creating an act, an hour, mm-hmm. an hour, 15 minutes. I mean, if you ever uh, watch Jerry Seinfeld's uh, a special called The Comedian, you know, he talks about, you know, creating an act. It's a it's it's really uh, putting it's like, you know, creating a car. I mean, it, it's it's put together with nuts and bolts. So I knew that a lot of work went into it. I, I, I was not starry eyed. It wasn't like, oh boy, I'm going to be a movie star. You know, kids come from all over the mm-hmm. country to Hollywood and they think they're going to be a star. They have no idea what it takes to do the work. I did. Mm-hmm. I did. You and knew. So I made a very, I made a really, uh, yes. you know, informed decision, as they say. But I, I also saw mm. when I would watch my father on the stage at the Sands Hotel or somewhere around the country where he would perform, I would always see his eyes were so shining. He was so happy. He loved Mm. the work. He loved (laughs) the connection with the audience and he had great respect for the audience. So, um, so I had that too, the love of the work and the, and the Mm. investment of the work. I love it. I love it so much. It's I can, you know, it is, you're right. It's one thing to wish and hope to be in in TV or film. And it's another to know what goes into the background of getting there and then to have the the fortitude to prepare yourself to do it. I mean, but that's the thing. That's what, you know, I, what I think what I loved in researching you, Marlo, is that everything that the, the character of that girl that was if she had gone on to have an entire life, it's like that's the life that you went on to create, continuing to always look for other ways to empower the women around you to do and be what they want to do. Like it's sort of like, you know, you live the legacy like of what she what you set her up to be. Right. Well, it was, yeah. And it was me. I yeah. Mean, it was, yeah. <laughs> you know, in other words, what I what I was playing and that girl was was the girl that I had been, yes. a young girl who wanted to be an actress, a young girl who was trying not to get married and not, you know, make her father mad at her <laughs> and, and be independent. I mean, I actually said or Anne Marie said on the show, uh, remember, the father came in and he said to me and Donald, oh, well, when are you two getting married? And I said, Daddy, I, I don't want to get married. 
I, I have my career. That that was revolutionary to yes, say that. Yes. You know, the young girl on on Father Knows Best didn't say that. No. You know, there were there were no single girls on television to say anything. But had they been able to say anything at, with their shows or my little Margie or the daughters on any of these shows, they never said things like that. Mm -hmm. So this was a, a radical thing to say. Mm -hmm. And that and the male was like, wow, you know, that's why. When we finished after five years, I, uh, the network and the and the sponsor Clara wanted a wedding. Yes, I, I read no. this. Oh my goodness! So tell the story. Yeah. <laughs> I said no, no, we can't have a wedding. I mean, that would be a betrayal mm -hmm. to all these girls and young women who've been following my adventure, and now I'm going to say the only happy ending is a wedding. Oh no, I can't do it. So I didn't. Thank God. I was the producer and I owned the show, but otherwise I could have lost that battle, but we didn't do it. And it was, I can, I cannot tell you the, the mail, Luann, that I got on that was, oh, Marlo, thanks for not copping out. Thanks so much for not get, having a wedding at the end. I mean, they were just thrilled about it because, and you know, when I did Free to Be You and Me, we rewrote Atalanta so that at the end of Atalanta, the princess does not marry the prince and she goes off to uh, adventure and so forth because she doesn't want to get married. Right. She runs the race with the, with the boy from the town. Uh, the fa her father, the king is, 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 uh, has her marriage, has her hand in marriage as the prize for the race that the boys are all running. And she says, I'm going to run in the race too. And if I win, <laughs> I'll decide. I mean, that's completely who I am. Right. And, and I thought it was important and it's, very, it's a very important story to girls. Very important story. Absolutely important because, it, to your point, you wouldn't have done it in real life. So why put it on TV? Because we all would have known that it was false. We would have been like, "Who is yeah. that? Where it happened to our that girl?" Right? right. And I love yeah. the uh, the ending of going to a women's lib meeting with Donald. Like, <laughs> like, like, like <laughs> yeah, that made nobody happy but me. I, I really love that. I oh that was, my god, uh, that's so awesome! And how did you co become the producer? Was that just from the beginning be again because you came in season and you just said look I'll do this but this is the deal or was that something because that also was radical were you were the, you were only after Lucille Ball the only woman to produce her own yeah. TV show it was you know it was really in steps because because they wanted me you know there's the the, the power is always in the demand and the mm. supply right who has so the leverage wanted, right <laughs> yeah they, yeah so they wanted me Clara wanted a young woman in which to sell their products, you know, their mm -hmm. shampoos and conditioners and makeup and all. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure there were other young women, but they chose me, you know, they wanted me to do it. So once I had a, a network and a sponsor mm -hmm. that gave me tremendous power to say, well, this is what I want to do. I don't want to do, uh, they said, we'd like you to be, you know, have a family unit. America isn't really ready for a girl to live in the big city without a family unit. So we'd like you to have your, your maiden aunt live with you. And I said, that's completely <laughs> not true. There are no girls moving to New York with their maiden aunt. That is completely out of, out of the question. Should we live you know? in the library too while we're at yeah, it? Like exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and wear a chastity belt, you know? So, so anyway, I mean, I had to educate them as to what girls were thinking. They weren't girls. They were men in their 40s. How would they know what right, girls thought? Right, right. So, um, uh, so, so that's why the Feminine Mystique book by Betty Friedan was so important because here was a grown woman saying what was going on in the country with women and what the, where the direction was. And, and so, again... I looked smarter than them only because I was a girl and they weren't, you know what I mean? I, I had information they didn't have and I had a lot of girlfriends. I mean, I knew a lot of young women. I graduated from college. I, I had uh, girlfriends who went on to study law or medicine or, or dental hygiene or become a, uh, an actress or producer or whatever. And I also knew a lot of girls who got married and had babies right away. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all, it was all happening at that time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of girls that I knew that got married like at 21, right out of college, you know, a lot of those marriages didn't last. Right. I mean, those, the, those girls 
by the time they were 35 were on their second marriage, you know, with a kid from the first marriage and a kid from the second marriage. And I thought, wow, this is really resistible. <laughs> this is not something I want to do. But it was because they were trying, well, they were trying to be good girls. They were trying to, to do what was expected of them. And the, and the thing we've all learned by now, men and women, is we can't do what's expected of us. We have to do what comes from us organically. Mm -hmm. It's the only chance you have in life mm -hmm. is at anything to be successful uh, as a married person or single person or a business person. The only chance you've got is to go with your gut and to do go with what organically you want to say and you want to do. And um, and that's the that's the exciting part. You know, I, I think of 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 a person as being like a big orange, you know, and you can squeeze that orange and get all the juice of life, you know, for your life. Or you can just leave it in the fridge, you know, mm. and not and not ever squeeze it. Mm. And I think that that the fun of life is 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 getting, you know, your particular kind of juice into into the world, into the cosmos. What you're doing you know, your friends aren't doing it. You're doing it. Mm -hmm. You're interviewing me or interviewing other people. You're learning from them. You're taking away stuff. You're you're sharing these stories of me and the other people you interview uh, with your audience. I mean, these are all your choices. These are all your decisions. I'm here today because I'm one of your decisions, mm. you know, and that's that that's who you are. And I, and that's not who somebody else is. And I I find that uh, interesting. Mm. And we, the, the message in there is that we have to have the courage and the confidence to say who and what we are to people who may or may not understand it and try and help them see and understand it the way you did and have done all through your life, right? Yeah, but I don't... I didn't really care too much who understood it. Well, I mean, you when know? you when you turn around to these guys, these forty something guys, and they're wanting you to have a family unit, it's like no, right. you know, no. Right. This this well, you had the well, courage I, to come back. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just saying, you know, it's not the truth. You know, nobody's doing that. You know, I said you you could comb the city of New York, and you won't find any young woman <laughs> twenty two years old living with her aunt. It just isn't. It isn't there. Right. You know, I mean, so I don't know who you're talking to. Right. You won't be talking to the girls of America, you know, and I think that they were flabbergasted. Mm. I mean, I know they were flabbergasted yeah. at, at at the success of the show from the first night. Mm. They just they were, you know, they just didn't they couldn't believe it because yeah. they thought it was going to be a hard sell. They were going to have to really fight for that audience. Yeah. And that audience was already there. And, you know, uh, I don't know, I, that was what I found for me so confirming because here I was, I, I didn't know if I was right or not. Mm. That's what I, you know, I said it, I believed it, but that doesn't mean I was right, <laughs> you know. That's the uh, courage yeah. part, though, that it felt yeah. right. You yeah. knew in your, like, it was like, you know, I always talk about listening to our inner voice, our goddess voice. It's like your inner, like you said, the organic, organic, authentic part of you was like, that's crazy. No 22 year old is going to live with their, you know, maiden aunt. And this is how a 22 year old is going to live. And right. if I got to line 20 of them up to show you, I guess I could, but I'm one right. of them. So what right. are we doing here? Right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And so you leave that experience and you then end up going and working with, um, uh, Gloria Steinem. I, I, this this is an era, a part of your career that I had not been aware of, and you were one of the founders of the Miss Ms. Foundation of for women. Like I was like, how did I not know that? Well, that's because of Free to Be You and Me. When I decided to do Free to Be You and Me, which was stories for boys and girls to right. have them become whoever they wanted to become, I needed a place to put the money. And I had met Gloria, so I oh. called her and I said, I need a place where I could put the money that I raised from Free to Be You and Me. I want to help women and children because mm. I had, when I was doing that girl, I got a lot of mail from young women. I, I got a letter from a 16-year-old girl who said, I'm 16 years old, I'm pregnant, and I can't tell my father 
do you know where I could go? Oh. Now, she was writing to the girl she saw on television, yes. right? This independent girl who seemed very resourceful. She was. She wrote to Marlo Thomas, but she was thinking Marlo Thomas was that girl, yeah, right? Yes. And then the young woman who wrote me and said, I'm 22 years old. My husband beats me up. I have two children. I, I, I don't know where to go for help. And so I was stunned by these letters. And uh, my assistants and I, I had two of them at the time, started looking for where a girl who's 16 could go who lived in Des Moines. Mm. And where could a woman who's 22 years old and husband beats her up could go when she lives in Salt Lake City mm. or wherever it was. And, we've, and we discovered that there was nowhere to go. There, there were no legal aids. There was no safe harbor for battered women. There wasn't even the name battered women. Right. It was just called unlucky. You know, nobody had anything. We're talking about the 60s and early 70s. So when I decided to do Free to Be You and Me, I thought the money I make from this, I want to put it into projects that will fund these kind of females with these kind of issues, mm -hmm. a place to go to for safety, a place to go, you know, to for legal assistance. And when I said that to Gloria, I said, if you could just give me some resources that I could hook up with. And she said, you know, at Ms. Magazine, uh, we're thinking, the founders and I are thinking of creating the Ms. Foundation for Women. Why don't you come in with us? Mm. And so I said, well, what would we do? And we talked about it. And she said, we'd do grants to help women, help women's groups, give seed money and so forth. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And so we founded it together. But it happened you know, from really the desire, the organic desire coming from me, coming from those letters, and those letters really politicized me. I wasn't a political person up until that time. I mean, I was a, I was a born feminist, but I didn't know what it was. Mm. Um, but I, I connected with those, the need and the desperation of those women, and I thought this is wrong. Mm. They have got to be able to find protection. You know, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. Those letters made me cry. Oh, I can't and imagine. I thought, and, feel, and I thought, how awful. I'm all they have. Mm. And I'm not even real. A man Marie, you know? Yeah. I wasn't even real. And uh, and that's who they were identifying with. I mean, I, they didn't know who Marlo Thomas was. They knew who Anne Marie was. Marlo Thomas could have been a terrible person who didn't give a damn about them, right? right? It turned out, but they trusted that Anne Marie would help them. Mm -hmm. And that's what touched me uh, very much. And so it became, you know, a part of of something, you know, that, that really, I think, stirred the pot inside of me and, and made me more uh, political. Mm. So it's it's so... It, it, it like I said, you just said they didn't know if Marlo Thomas was, you know, whatever, like that she was going to. That's what I was trying to express at the beginning of the interview, that the more I read about you, I was like, oh, you are actually really this person who believes in all of these things. Like it wasn't just a TV show as you know, you really was somebody who cared about feminism and, you know, making sure that everybody has yeah. opportunities. So interesting. And so, well, I wasn't, I wasn't cast in that girl. I created. I hear you. Yeah. Now so that's I'm a understanding. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And that's a nuance to it. That's, that's yeah. new and interesting for me to understand. So, so free to be you and me, tell us a little bit about that and how, how did that come to be that you started to do this and write these books? Uh, well, that was my, my sister, Terry, had a, her first child, the first grandchild in our family, Dion, who was a, not quite five. And I was reading books to her in her little library. And they were all, you know, the prince comes along and wakes you up. And then, uh, <laughs> and, you know, the, the glass slipper and then you marry the prince. And I said to my sister, oh, my God, you're reading her <laughs> this same imagine. crap that it took us 30 years to get over. And she said, that's all there is. So I went to the bookstore thinking she just didn't know how to look and there wasn't anything. So I thought, OK, I'm just going to write her one myself. I'll just create it. And so I got my friends together and we created Free to Be You and Me. I, when we, we made the album first and when we, it was a company called Bell Records, I think it was the name of it, and he. The, the head of it said to me, look, you're only going to sell, you know, tops about 15,000 
uh, records, but I like the idea and we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Well, of course, it went gold and platinum and became this big, huge thing. But see, again, they didn't know who they were dealing with. They didn't know who the, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what was going on in the country. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't just me yeah. any more than that girl was. Right. That girl spoke to the young girls of America. Yeah. Free to be you and me spoke to teachers, mm. spoke to moms raising children, mm. saying, oh, my God, I, I want my daughter to to know that she can be anything she wants to be. I want my son to know it's okay to have a doll. I want my son to know it's all right to cry. I want my kids to be free to have their feelings. You know, I really do believe this sincerely. If you believe something really strongly, as I believed in those, for example, two projects, it's probably true. Mm. You're not the only one who thinks that. You know, we, the, 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 it's not like I said, you know, what would be a really great commercial success. I'll do a, a record for children where they can be free. If I had done that, it probably wouldn't have been. But this came from me organically for my niece, for her not to grow up in a in a in a society that was going to tell her who she could be. Uh, and that is the um, that is, that is really to me sort of the golden rule. Do what you think is a good idea. Fight like hell to get your idea done. And it will probably connect with a lot of people mm -hmm. if it's really truly from you. It makes sense. It makes total sense. It's not It's not this objective, hey, that would be a I, moneymaker. Right, right. It's something passionately and just at your core connected to a message or something that you believe in. Right. Yeah. I, that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. I I love it. And and do you given where we are now in the world and you know this last year right now we're recording it's the you know beginning of 2021 and 2020 of course you know an insane year on all levels the pandemic and the uh, movement for Black Lives Matter taking a huge front stage as it finally and rightfully should do you feel like there's the next, like I think about your Free to Be You and Me series and books and shows and all the things and wonder, is there another movement in there now that it's, that it has to teach, it's, we're free to be black, brown, <laughs> yellow, all the things. Yeah, well, uh, Free to Be, the original was an anti-racist as well as an anti-sexist mm. uh, endeavor. Uh, we had a lot of uh, you know, songs and stories about children of all colors being friends and Harry Belafonte and I singing mommies are people and daddies are people. Uh, well, it was all very groundbreaking. Uh, but, but yeah, we're, we're, we're thinking of doing one now for tweens to take on mm. some of the issues of, of today that are different. I mean, social media and bullying and all the stuff that's going on is different. And also we've been through a bad time in this country where a lot of hatred has come out. Yes. Uh, and the hatred was always there, but it was given a chance to come out of the sidewalks, mm -hmm. uh, up through the you know cracks in the sidewalks. Um, and so you know, we need to have a conversation about the other, how, you know, that everybody's the other mm -hmm. and that nobody is just the one, uh, one acceptable uh, group or tribe. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, a lot of new stuff. Yeah, I mean, the LGBT, I always say those letters wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, LGBTQ. yes, yes. I mean, like, you know, more and more, I, 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 in my, just my limited world, more and more, I'm meeting young people in their 20s that are transgender, that are coming out as gay or lesbian in high school. You know, I mean, right. that wouldn't have happened. My I, my own stepson is a gay man, and he came out in college. And even when he came out in college, it was, I we knew that it was almost like, he needed to be away to be sure before he came back and said it. And of course, we were like, yeah. but we knew it since you were eight. You're not shocking us. Right. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's such a fun conversation. I mean, I'm interested that we're having this conversation when you're a design maven, right? <laughs> Aren't you all about design? Oh, no. I'm all about the business. I'm not, I'm not oh. about the design. <laughs> oh, I, I thought your, I thought your, uh, yeah. uh, your podcast and your, 
It was good. I mean, I'm loving the conversation yeah. because I love to talk about being a free person. But I, I thought you were a design person. No. But, so, but, so what it is is that we, on this show, we help interior designers and other creatives run their business more profitably. And when uh, I have the opportunity to do a show with someone like yourself, Marlo, I know that a lot of being a profitable business owner is steeped in hearing and listening to our own voice and gathering our courage. And so right. you gathered your courage and it resulted in all of these endeavors that have helped so many of the rest of us. And so the analogy for my listeners is, you know, there are lots of people out there that want their homes to be healthy and beautiful and support them on a physical and an aesthetic level. And sometimes designers need the courage that they borrow from from people like you to know that what's in them and their passion is important and it should come out. And so my hope with this conversation is that they will see and hear and learn all of the things you've accomplished because you had the courage of your convictions is the thing. Uh -huh. And so that's the crossover and the lesson. <laughs> oh, I see. No, that's interesting. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. So we are going to talk about the Williamson Sonoma initiative, which will be of also great interest to the designers. But indulge me in one more question before we switch gears. I read that you fell in love at first sight with Phil when you went on his show. And I right. just, I just thought, what is that like first? Like first, like I, I had a really great first, first time, ex you know, um, I was going to experience as if it was <laughs> something illicit. But my first meeting of my husband also um, was very significant and very telling and ended up portending this great 40 year marriage. However, I don't know that I would say the word fell in love at first sight. So tell me a little bit about that feeling and that experience, because I, again, I think it's, it's important for somebody to understand when someone's is able to put it to words like you can. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I fell in love or I fell in lust, uh, but, but, but um, because I had an hour, you know, the Donahue show was uh, one guest, one hour. Yes. And, and, you know, I had been on the Johnny Carson show and the Merv Griffin show and all the other shows and they're all like seven, eight minutes. Yeah. And, and it's a little bit of sort of fakery, you know, you yeah. tell a little funny thing and they say a funny thing and you plug your book or your television show and you're off. Yeah. But when you're on one hour with a person, one to one, mm. you really do get to know the person a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm watching, first of all, I thought he was gorgeous. <laughs> You know, that those big blue Irish eyes and the white hair. I had never seen him. His show was not on in L.A. Mm. So I had not seen him before. So it was quite shocking when he walked in the green room. I thought, wow, what a good looking man. And then we started talking in the show and he was funny and he was playful. And he had this thing that I love in people, this tremendous confidence. Mm. And he was running around the audience, talking to people in the audience, uh, using a phone to get a caller, then back to me, then back to the audience, then the caller, then me. And it was all so easy. He was, he was like a ballet dancer. And I, uh, there's a turn on, uh, I think, uh, talent is a turn on. Mm -hmm. And, and he was talented. He was talented and he was confident. And I, I just thought, wow, what a guy. Yeah. And I could tell he liked me. He was flirting with me. And then when the show was over, um, I left. And then he called me the next day to tell me uh, what a wonderful guest I was and all that stuff, which I knew was, you know, just to talk to me. <laughs> and uh, and I was by this time in Denver. <clears throat> I was I was on a tour, <clears throat> excuse me, for for a movie I had done. And so I was in Chicago the day I saw him. And then the following day, I went to Denver to do some Den Colorado stuff. And so he said, I'd love to take you to dinner. I said, well, I'm in Denver. Is that is that far from Chicago? You know, and he said, oh, no, it's not far at all. So he came to have dinner with me in Denver. And and that kind of was it. I mean, we, we started going out and we dated uh, for three years. Um, and after about six months, uh, he asked me to marry him. And I said, oh, no. I, I as I had said on his show, I don't ever want to be married. He said to me, "How does a girl like you never get married?" I said, "Oh, I'm never getting married." Um, so 
so he kind of was surprised because we were so hot and heavy. But um, we went together for about three years, and then we decided to get married. And it was it was complicated because I lived in L.A. and he lived in Chicago, and he had a daily job, and he's raising four sons by himself. I lived in L.A. and I had a big production company was doing like a movie a year for television. So we, it was complicated, but we put it together. Mm. Um, yeah. I love it. So, I love it. It's, yeah. So mm. it sort of confirms because for Vin and myself, it was similar. It was that initial attraction. And then we had the same opportunity to have an hour long conversation. And so it actually sounds very similar. He didn't you know, fly to Denver to take me to dinner or anything, <laughs> but <laughs> right, yeah. oh, that's fun. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. I feel very privileged to hear that. Thank you. All right. So should we talk about Williams and Sonoma? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. It's yes. my passion. So tell us a little bit about it. Tell us what, you know, I, I have 10 questions, but I'd love for you to open up the conversation about your collection. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I, I learned how to entertain from my mom. My mother was Italian, mm. and she fed everybody. I mean, you, you could not get away without my mother giving you something to eat. My mother would make a sandwich for the FedEx guy. You know, <laughs> she took care of everybody. Uh, a meatball sandwich, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, she was great. But she loved to entertain, and she and she was a housewife. I mean, she took care of the house. She took care of the children. She took care of my dad. She was a little bit more than a housewife since she traveled with my dad. So she was, you know, not stuck at home, but, you know, got out uh, a lot. Um, and But she was a, a great hostess and she made everything beautiful. Mm. And so I I had a great love of, of, of flowers and settings and tables and making things beautiful. And and she used to say the and she said it was a French saying that that uh, the eyes eat before the stomach. Mm. So if something is something is beautiful, you know, you want to try it. If it looks like a clump on this on the plate, you might not try it. Mm. Um, and so she always made everything very pretty and very appetizing. And she was very good at uh, making people feel welcome. You know, there was always music playing. And so as I grew up and started to give my own dinner parties, you know, I added to that with scented candles and stuff that that she didn't do in her day. But scented candles and and flowers and party favors and all kinds of things to make people feel welcome and and have them um, you know have a good time. You know, it's I think a dinner party starts with an invitation, but then once they get to your house, they have to continue to feel invited. Mm. You know that they're not just you know sometimes you go to somebody's house and you feel you've sort of been abandoned. You know, to my way of thinking. You know, when when they come to your house right away, they should feel welcome. The room is scented. There's flowers. There's there's chilled wine on the table. There's there's cheese and crackers and maybe some Italian food and maybe some Lebanese food, which is the other side of my family (laughs) and thing and things that look personal and come from you. And when they get to the table, there's something with their name on it, a little trinket or something that just makes them feel um, that you wanted them to come. The invitation didn't end with the with the inv- invitation to attend. And so that has a lot to do with what I put on the table. When I was in London doing Barefoot in the Park, I used to go to Portobello Road, which is sort of a crazy combination between a flea market and a, and a junkyard <laughs> and an antique shop. And I found all these treasures of wood and silver and porcelain things I'd never seen before. And I was there a year, so I started buying. I used to go every Saturday. It was only open on Saturday. And I had a matinee on Saturday, so I'd go early in the morning and, and dig through the junk and find these things and get them home. You didn't know if it, if it was it a, was it nickel, was it was it tin, was mm. it silver? You know, and you'd polish it up and say, oh, my God, it's silver. You know, um, and so a lot of those pieces I have to this day. Wow. I've always collected things. And, and so the... Uh, the CEO of William Sonoma came to my house for a St. Jude fundraiser, and um, uh, she's a very stylish, very beautiful young woman, and with a lot of power. I'm talking about power. She's really got power, mm. but she loves what she does. She absolutely loves it. And she was at my cocktail table, and she said, "Oh, I've never seen such beautiful things. What is this? And where did this come from?" I said, "Oh, I bought that 
when I was in France. I got that in Portugal. These are from England. This is from this is when I was in Kyoto, Japan. She said, I just love this. You've got to do a collection for us. And so that's how it started. And so I'm really sharing all the stuff that I love. We we recreated uh, many of the wood and silver and porcelain things that I got on Portobello Road and uh, and did them, you know, uh, for today. And they're just beautiful pieces. And um, and they're selling really well. So I'm very excited about that. And then I created it. I always wanted, she said to me, you've got everything. I said, actually, there's one thing I don't have. And she said, what's that? I said, I've always wanted a cheese tray that had a place for the crackers and a place for fruit so I could carry out one tray. Oh. Now I carry out a, you know, a, a cheese board and then I carry out a basket for crackers and then another little basket for fruit for the grapes or something. I've always wanted one. She said, you draw it and we'll make it. <laughs> So I did, and they did, and it's really one of the best sellers. Everybody wants it. It's just great. You should go on the William Sonoma website and put in Marlo Thomas cheese tray, and you'll see this. And it's you'll buy it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it just brings me right back to when you were telling those forty-year-old men, "This is what people want. This is what they want." Like you said, if you really need it, you really want it, you really believe in it. Yes. Here you are, somebody, right. an ex- seasoned, accomplished hostess, and you're like, "We need this kind of tray." <laughs> yeah. So that's been a, a very big passion of mine. My whole life was is to entertain well and 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 do it with fun and whimsy and flair, and everything doesn't have to match. Mm. You know. Uh, one of the things I talk about on my William Sonoma uh, website is that, you know, it, it, the the days of getting um, a set of china and a set of crystal and your patterns and your patterns and your patterns, that's over. Yeah. You know, take your pattern, whatever you have, and mix it up with other stuff. It doesn't have to, you, I don't want to see the same thing on the appetizer plate, the salad plate, the dinner plate, the cup, the dessert plate. That's like being in a restaurant and you're at somebody's home. You want to see the things that they've collected, that they mm-hmm. have. So if I, if I have a flowered plate for the first course, then I want a, maybe a, a, a striped plate for the dinner course and some, mm-hmm. something else for the, for the coffee and dessert so that it's fun. It's something, you know, the eye is entertained. Mm. Yeah, I mean the the way of the 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 twenty billion piece china set went the way of the Donna Reeds, right? Like, who wants that? Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but if you have that, if you have that set, just mix it up. Mix it, it up. Doesn't mean you have to throw it out, right? Just you know, you use that as the dinner plate or as your cup and saucer and dessert plate, and put something else everywhere else. Mm. And then all of a sudden, the table becomes alive mm. because it's you. It's you at the table. It's right. not the restaurant. You know, right. it's you. Right. And so the process of working with Williams and Sonoma on the collection. So we've had a lot of conversations on the show with designers that have developed fabric lines. And so, for instance, Kravit is one of our main sponsors of the podcast, Marlo, and they have different designers that Nate Burkus and Candace Olson and um, Corey Damon Jenkins, people that have developed furniture or fabric lines with them. And they talk about the artistic process of what they bring to the table and then working with the Kravitz studio and the studio designers in saying like, here's my vision, here's my idea. So for example, when this CEO says to you, you draw it on paper, we'll figure it out. Were you then like a back and forth? Was that a collaborative oh, sure. thing? Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I measured out how wide I thought the plate should be you know, I did it with different pieces that I had, putting them together and pretending that they were one piece and <laughs> saying, well, I need this much space for three or four cheeses and I need this much space for crackers. And I want the, and I want that little porcelain plate to have a rounded bottom so the cracker can just fit in it. You know, so I had all these ideas and then I wanted the handles. I copied the handles off of a of an of a bowl I had gotten on on Portobello Road, so that it still had all the elements of some of the old English stuff, but they didn't make cheese boards. <laughs> so, uh, so I used the porcelain and the wood and the silver, and 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 copied 
different pieces, like for example the the frame and and the and the handles that are really beautiful. Uh, and it's wonderful because the silver is is uh, plated over brass, so you don't ever have to polish it. They're bright silver all the time. Uh, so I was very excited. To, again, for me, I don't want to spend my days polishing silver. <laughs> Those days are over. So, you know, all the silver is... I'm shocked. Uh, yeah. Right. And then also, you know, we took different things and said, well, let's make the handles, you know, bigger than this. And let, let's let's have the base not have feet on it because that kind of looks sort of i don't know prissy mm. but if it's solid if the thing if the if the bowl just sits on the table rather with a pedestal rather than little feet that'll give it a more modern and a stronger look and that a man would buy it too mm. you know a wood and silver piece looks beautiful on anybody's table i mean they're all mine they're on my tables but a guy who's who's single and he's doing his own apartment and his own dinner parties. He'd buy a wood, a wooden, uh, uh, say, wine holder, uh, and with silver handles. It looks beautiful on a bar. Mm. So I, I wanted something that would appeal to you know to men and women. That wouldn't be too, too, um, too feminine, mm. but strong. You know. Well, I'm just so thrilled to know that it's just one more authentic, organic endeavor, that it's not just, hey, Marlo Thomas, let me just put my name on this stuff. Yeah, that one looks good. Take two of those and put my name on it. That it's really, you know, something born of your life, your passions, your travels, and, you know, to your point of the actual functionality of entertaining. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so glad to know it. It's like, if it hadn't been that way, I would have been like, okay, but I'm just happy to know. <laughs> But I really want you to go to the William Sonoma uh, website and look at this stuff, and you'll see what I mean. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's really beautiful and it's unusual, yeah. and I think that that's why it's selling so well. Mm. And you know, I have a podcast too. With well, my that's husband. what I was just going to bring up. I said the last yeah, thing I yeah. wanted to talk with you about is your podcast with Phil. So tell us. Yeah. Well, you know, we did a book together uh, for our 40th wedding anniversary because we never ever talked about our marriage. We were we thought we just it's better it'd be more protected and strong and healthy if we keep it private, which we did for all our lives. And um, but we were we were approaching when we when we had our 39th anniversary, we said what we're going to do for our 40th, and then we got the idea to do a book. And Phil said, oh, but I don't want to talk about our marriage. I said, well, you don't have to. We're going to interview other long married couples. Yeah, nice. But we got together with other long married couples, and of course they talk and you talk, and it was like a double date. So we named our podcast Double Date at, because we sat down with Kelly Ripa and Mark Consuelos or John McEnroe and Patty Smythe, and they would talk about jealousy, and then we would talk about jealousy or how they fought and how we fought, and where they met and whatever. And it was the conversations were just so fun and so juicy. And so now uh, uh, it's on Pushkin, but of course it's on Apple or wherever you get your podcast. And it's called Double Date. And it's me and Phil talking to Viola Davis and her husband, Julius Tennant, mm. or whoever. It's extremely, it's really a lot of fun. Oh, I, I, of fun. yeah. I, it's just something else. I think it's awesome. I think it's, you know, those, like you said at the beginning, to have the hour-long conversation, like you've the gift you've given us today to have the hour-long conversation, to really get in and learn about somebody as opposed to just the surface. To you know, So for right. you guys are getting in and learning about the marriage and talking about the actual real things, the vulnerabilities, the happiness, all the, all the stuff, right? Right, exactly. And, and, the, and the thing is, is that when you hear the voices and the banter, yeah. and all like Viola Davis, who's such a great actress, and she's so formidable when you see her on these award shows. Mm -hmm. But when she sits down with her husband, she's just another wonderful right. female wife, friend, person, uh, a darling woman. I, I so enjoyed her. She was so different than I expected. And and to sit down with Neil Patrick Harris and his husband, mm. David Berka, mm. and hear how a same-sex marriage, you know, what's that like? And right. And is it different than a than a heterosexual marriage? And the and the fact is, they're not. Right. They're worried about the same thing: <laughs> jealousy, money, their sex life, how they date, how they fight. I mm. mean, yeah, yeah. how they deal with their children. I mean, it's it's really interesting. It's it, it's it's interesting is the word, and it's fun. Mm. It has it has fun in it. We always have a lot of laughs. Um, 
stumbling over ourselves. Uh, <laughs> and my husband has said he would never talk about our marriage. There he is chatting away. You know, <laughs> You're kicking uh, him under the table. Not that story, sweetie. <laughs> you know, you know, I found it so shocking that he would take part in the conversation. It was, it was great. It, it really is fun. That's awesome. So, um, yeah, I we're love in it. First season. Yeah, I yeah, I'm I'm excited to dig into it. It's really. Um, okay, so that- yeah, I mean, I, I literally, you know, I said it in the beginning, the two of you are iconic people for my particular life, you know, um, and uh, it's so funny because I can remember when I was first, um, when my daughter, I said high school, but I meant older. I don't know how long Phil was on at this point, but I always tell the story when Vin and I, we had we have had our own business for 40 years. And when we were first in business and it came time for me to have a baby, you know, he said to me, he says, you know, unlike the, the men of the generation before, he's like, well, you know, if you have a kid, you're going back to work. I'm like, try and keep me out of work. Yes. Right. 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 But you know, I yeah, fought, great. yeah, but I fought like crazy for a three month maternity leave. Marlo, I was like, you know, yeah. you have to give me three months with this baby. And he's looking at me. He's like, and I was the, the number one sales driver at that point in our business. And he's looking, he's like, I don't know, three months. Right. Not that he, the father wanted to give it to me. The man who manages the money in the business was like, uh oh, right? <laughs> right? And so ultimately we agree on the three months. Well, the end of the story is that I go back to work after six weeks because I'm absolutely <laughs> out of my mind. And the only thing, so here is the funny thing. I remember always being going dri- driving around to all my sales appointments all day, and here it would be on the radio today on Phil Donahue, la 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 la, and wow. today on wow. Oprah, la 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 la, and it was between Oprah and Phil, and every day I'd be like, everybody gets to watch Oprah and Phil every day, and I never get to watch it, and of course there was no DVR <laughs> then or anything, right? And so the the four weeks that I was home with her. Marlo, when I tell you my entire day was just about getting me and this baby under control so that at four o'clock I could flip (laughs) on and see who was Phil talking to today and then flip over and see who Oprah was talking to today and then pick between Phil and Oprah. (laughs) That's hilarious. That's great. It is. It's like, you know, like people thought they knew you. I feel like I know him. I feel like I know you. It's like part of our lives. Yeah, on, On his show. You certainly did get a good chance to see who this guy was, yeah. what and he cared about, yeah. you know, what where his interests were mm-hmm. and how much he cared about what women thought. That's yes. what, you know, he was the first guy uh, or first person on television who listened to the women in the audience. There wasn't anybody who ever did that before. You're right. You're you know? right about that. I hadn't thought you know? about that, but you're right. Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, think that's why I spoke to, you know, us. Like, here I'm 23, 25 years old, whatever it is. And I'm just like, okay, what's Phil going to say today? <laughs> that, exactly. Yeah. It was um, a lot of years before Oprah was there. Yes. Uh, yeah. He know, was there before. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, I just cannot tell you what an absolute thrill this was for me to get to know you. Thanks. I think. Thanks. I mean, the bigger thrill is to know and to learn that you are exactly who I imagined you to be. And that's it's always scary, right, when you meet somebody. But I always wanted to be a woman of mystery, but I guess it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, it's too late. <laughs> well, I wish you all the best success with everything you Thank do, you. in particular the Williams and Sonoma collection, which we will put Thank into you. our newsletter and our Instagram. Well, that would be great. Yeah, all of Good. the things. And then, of course, the podcast, Double Date with Phil, I'm really looking forward to all of the conversations that you have there. Thank you so much, Thanks. Marlo. Thank you, Luann. Good luck to you. It was, I love the conversation. It was a lot of fun. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Oh, my goodness. All righty. Marlo Thomas, that girl on our podcast. <laughs> How cool is that, right? And I want to share with you, I did tell Marlo this off air. We all know my cousin Eileen Hahn, right? She's our resident expert on leadership and all things team building when we want to grow a company that has exceptional people in it, all working in their superpowers, right? She's our go-to. Well, Eileen's daughter, her name is Gayla Marlo Han. That's right. She's named after Marlo Thomas. That is because this is what an influence Marlo Thomas has been on the women of my generation. And if you are from our generation, then you know this to be true, right? And I just love that 
You know, when you meet somebody that you've admired for dozens of years now, it's, it's exciting and it's scary because what if they're not everything you thought they were? Well, I'm here to tell you, Marla, Marla was, she was on air, off air, just as, just as you imagine her to be just a genuine, warm, loving, giving soul. So I'm so thrilled and grateful. Now, I also was so just excited to see this thread that has gone through her life, this conviction that she wholeheartedly lives by and that has shaped her creativity and her career and her personal life. You could hear it in the stories, right? And I have to say, in the introduction, I went through so many of her her accomplishments that we didn't even get a chance to touch on here. But when you now have heard the interview, go back and read the introduction or listen to it again. I mean, my goodness, we barely touch the iceberg of the way that her authentic convictions and courage have been the through thread of her her entire life. Okay. I mean, honestly, let's just go back to she's 20 something years old. And she's telling a huge brand, the big guys at the television station, that their idea for a show was yesterday's news and that they have no idea what America's females really want. I love it. And I have to say as much as I love it, I'm not sure what impresses me more. Her, hey, you guys are way off. Let me tell you what will actually work if you want to listen, right? Or how she explained to us, she worked bit by bit to get herself into that room in the first place, right? She had to work so hard leading up to the moment so that when she was finally there, they took her seriously, Okay. And that is so cool. And she explained that she understood and she did that work because she had the privilege of watching her father all of his years. She watched her father pair his work ethic with his love for his career. All right. She watched him practice, practice, listen to his performance, iterate and practice some more. She knew what the path to success looked like and she knew that it was paved with hard work. Okay. And I, she also knew that talent and loving what you do has to be paid, you know, paired with that hard work, right? That you can't just be talented. And she learned that from her dad. And I think that's so cool. Now, she took that to the beginning of her career, right? And she explained to us how she started at little community theaters anonymously. So, where did you start in your interior design career? probably very much the same, right? Your your friends, mothers, sisters, guest bedroom, right? And you're like, really? But that's what you did. And you did one and then you did another and you got better and better. You probably made some mistakes and you learned from them and then you didn't make them the next time, right? Because, you know, Marlo talked about self-doubt too. So she said if she could have gotten off that plane or made it turn around when she was headed to London, she would have, right? But she couldn't and she didn't let the fear stop her. She kept going and so can you. Because it's not that the people that we look to and we admire who have quote unquote made it, it's not that they don't have fear. No, ma'am. No, sir. Everyone is human. They have the fear but they push through it. They push ahead despite the fear, just like Marlo described, okay? Because this is where things get good. This is where you really start to come into your own and you come to really start to experience personal and professional growth when you push through those fears, okay? And of course, Marlo was fortunate to have her father as the role model, okay? But even if you don't have that, you cannot let you let it hold you back. All right. You have mentors, you have this community, and you have you. You have the person in the mirror. You have it in you to stand in a room, to look your client in the eye, and with total conviction, provide a vision and a plan for a beautiful, fantastic project. You have it in you to get back up after a failure and do it better the next time. You are capable of having a wildly successful business. It's in you as long as you are willing to put in the work, right? So there's mistakes, there's failure, but there's learning and refining and going for it again. That's what it takes. Okay, that's what Marlo did. That's what her father did. All right. And as Marlo said to us, 
Everybody gets a first chance, but not everybody gets a second chance. So be ready for that first chance when it comes along. I remember starting the podcast. It wasn't a lot different five years ago. What did I know about doing a podcast? Not a whole heck of a lot, but I brought that same kind of conviction to it. And I actually took that same path. Mistake, get back up, (laughs) make another mistake, get back up again. And here we are at almost 700 episodes. All right. And and before I go on, I would just want to give a shout out to Kravit here. We all know the story, how they've been with me from the very beginning. They were those big people in a room looking at this crazy lady telling them, no, I think this is something designers really need. They're going to listen. I am sure of it. And they heard it and they understood it and they backed us and they helped me with you build this amazing community. So please check out Kravit.com if you're looking for fabrics, wool coverings, trims, and even quick ship furnishings. Furnishings. Go to Kravit.com. Don't forget to use your coupon code AWDB10. You'll get 10% off any one purchase, okay? You'll love their excellent service and your clients will appreciate the Kravit quality for years to come. So what do you think about Marlowe's foray into product design, right? I have to say, definitely take a look at the collection for Williams and Sonoma. It is simple, tasteful collection that has universal appeal. I mean, listen to me telling you, you guys are the tastemakers. You go look at it. I mean, between Marlo Thomas and William Sonoma, how can you go wrong? All right. Please take a look at the cheese tray. Marlo uh, was talking to us about it. We'll be in the stories. It really is brilliant in its practicality. And you know what it is? It's when you are passionate about something. Marlo explained how she gets her love of entertaining from her mother. She admires the way her mother did it all those years. She brings it to her own entertaining. And she talks about, we talk about the client experience, right? And she mentioned it. It reminded me, I don't know if you were thinking it at the same time, but I was like, this is what we talk about. We talk about making sure that our clients have an elevated experience. But that's how Marlo was describing when guests come to her home. She wants them to feel special. And um, I just think that it's just awesome that when the CEO of Williams and Sonoma suggested that she do this, that she like said to herself, yes, <laughs> there is a gap in this space. The world needs a, tree, a cheese tray that makes sense, right? I mean, I'm, I'm laughing and I'm smiling at it, but it's true. It's just as she said, you know, it's why was it never made this way before? So I just think it's awesome that she at this stage in her life, her career, and she just said, yes, this is authentically me. This is something I can do. I want to do. And there is a reason for me to do it. So please head over to Williams and Sonoma and definitely check out her new collection. And finally, the new podcast, Double Date, with her husband, Phil Donahue. Phil is another who influenced me, as I said on the show. I hated having to pick between him and Oprah every day. I have to say, that was so hard. And this was before DVRs and things. Um, But when Marlo was describing the way the things that she noticed about Phil that first time that she was on his show, I have to say, I, I was right back there with her because Phil it always was so warm, so genuine, so funny, so interested in his guests. It was like, it was almost like it was just him and the guest in a room. If you've never seen the Phil Donahue show, I imagine that they're somewhere somehow to be seen, but um, really also super, super individual. Personally, don't have the, I don't have the personal experience with it, but listen, if I can look to, up to Marlo for this many years and to Phil for this many years and they can be together and Marlo can be the real deal, then let's just say if this is like an algebra problem, right? If this, that, then this. So Phil's got to be great too. Let's just go there. <laughs> so um, the new podcast is outstanding. Like she said, she mentioned the different guests. Also Ted Danson and Mary Steenbergen on there. Two other icons from my era, right? Rodney and Holly Robinson, Pete, Viola and Julius. You have to check it out. It's tons, tons and tons of fun. All right. So what's the big takeaway here? Work hard, put the hours in to be an expert at what you do. Then do you be you listen to your inside voice, make the world better in whatever way that is for you through your design, through mentorship, through your community. I I think you can do it. Be part of it, right? Decide to be excellent. 
Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.